All right, hello everyone. Um, I am Claire with the American Museum of Western Art. And again, thank you for joining us for our AMWA After Hours program on the history of the Navarre. I plan to present for about 30 minutes and leave some time at the end, 10 to 15 minutes uh, for questions and comments. So if you have questions or comments, please put them in the chat uh, and I will get to them at the end, although you can enter them at any time during the presentation. Uh, and to start off, I want to acknowledge that while people are watching this program from a variety of places, the land that the Navarre building now sits on is the traditional land of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples, and that the Dakota peoples also have ties to this land. And also that the history of the building itself is very heavy on lore, and legends uh, that are kind of hard to prove or disprove uh, with available documentation. Uh, as I'm sure many of you are aware there's all sorts of great stories, often of illegal doings that um, the people involved wouldn't necessarily want in a written record. So researching this building has been quite an adventure. Uh, that being said, some of the exact dates of significant events that have happened in and around the building um, and some of the people involved are not really indicated or vary from source to source. Uh, just a quick little background with uh, Denver itself. So the city, the city of Denver grew up very much as a frontier town, um, typical Western stereotype frontier town. Uh, it was filled with both opportunity and danger for the people who visited or settled in the late 1800s. Uh, in 1859, people started coming to Colorado in earnest due to the gold rush. There was gold discovered um, in the Clear Creek area and also down in the Colorado Springs area. So people were coming en masse and little settlements were popping up all over the place for uh, prospectors to live in, to stop through, and for people who um, had things to sell or trade with said gold prospectors to settle in and travel through as well. Um, one of those places being what we now know as Denver. So initially there were two rival cities uh, where the Cherry Creek and the Platte River meet. Uh, one was called Auraria and one was Denver City. They were both founded 1858, 1859, um, but they officially merged in 1860. So they were short-lived as rival towns um, merging into a formal town in 1860 known as Denver. In 1870, the first of many railroad lines came into the city and that allowed um, many, in 1870, um, the first of many railroad lines came into the city that had sort of started dwindling in population uh, because the gold wasn't there as much, or the silver, uh, there are many silver mines as well. Uh, and that kind of breathed new life and new industry into the city. The population started growing again. And in addition to mining and supplying miners, we also got um, other industries that were growing and thriving in and around Denver, including um, ranching and agriculture uh, beyond the city itself, um, banking and trade, a little bit of manufacturing. And um, it continued this sort of entertainment industry that was that started with the early city to entertain and cater to miners and the other people passing through. Um, this industry was dominated by saloons and gambling, uh, which our building has ties to. But initially, um, the building was not a gambling house. Uh, and this is an early picture of the city. It's sadly not Tremont Place where the building is located, um, but Larimer Street. 
looks quite different today. Um, here's a picture from the early years of the building. It was built in 1880 and designed by the Denver-based architect, Frank E. Edbrook. Uh, initially, it was part of the Brinker Collegiate Institute. Uh, so this institute was owned and run by Joseph and Elizabeth Brinker as a school. It was sort of a college prep school. So for those students uh, who are wealthy or intelligent enough to go on to secondary school and hopefully then on to college. Uh, it was both a day school and a boarding school. So students from the Denver area would go for the day um, and students as far east as Mississippi and as far west as uh, California would board um, on the upper floors during the term. It was a well-respected school. Uh, Professor Brinker ran the school uh, and his wife and one of his sons taught at the school. It, as I said, was very well-respected quite prestigious at the time. Um, and it had curriculum topics that included reading, grammar, math, science, but also um, more interesting topics such as military strategy and proof of God. The, there was also an auxiliary commercial arm to the Brinker Collegiate Institute that taught things like bookkeeping uh, to non-traditional and adult students in addition to those college prep students. Um, in terms of what we could figure out about the layout of the building is that the fourth floor, um, which is the top floor of art, held dormitory space for boys. Uh, the third floor held dormitory space for girls. And these floors included um, water closets, baths, and gas heating, as well as fireplaces, as you could probably see the many fireplace chimneys in the photo. The second floor was parlors, receiving rooms, music rooms, uh, the kindergarten department, so it had young students as well, and a chapel. Um, the first floor, which if you've physically been to the museum, is this sort of garden level that you can see almost below the street here. Um, it's also where you enter the museum now. Uh, that held the dining room, office, some classrooms, uh, and a parlor and a kitchen. And the basement, uh, which is quite small, <laughs> held a steam heating plant, a laundry, and a refrigeration room for the kitchen. Uh, Joseph Brinker, the owner and proprietor of the school passed away in 1886, so this school closed. Um, and I believe the building sat vacant for a while, but in 1889, uh, two gentlemen, C.W. Hunsicker and Robert Stockton, ran the building as the Richelieu. Um, and this Richelieu was a hotel and gentlemen's club known as a place to gamble. They remodeled the building extensively before opening it in May of 1889. Um, another partner that they worked with uh, who stayed with the building, most likely managing it for a long time was Charles E. Allison. Uh, sometime in the 1890s, the cupola that was on the building was removed. So you can see the Navarre building here. Uh, again, it's many chimneys, but it is missing the crowning cupola that we saw in the Brinker Collegiate Institute photos. Uh, it's believed that it retained fire damage from a fire in the building in 1891, so they removed it um, because of that. Although, again, hard, hard to verify. Um, and part of this extensive remodel was um, the first floor, housing public and private dining rooms, like the one we see in this image here. The second floor had a saloon, a bar, um, and some gambling rooms. And the third and fourth floors were hotel rooms. It's also rumored that uh, there was a bordello that was being run out of the Richelieu, so um, perhaps some of those rooms were also used for prostitution, not just uh, sleeping. Uh, we can see here a uh, dining room, um, maybe a little later than the Richelieu days, 
uh, that the Richelieu and later Navarre Cafe dining rooms house high booths, seen here, the uh, heavy red drapes, hunting trophies, and game hunting paintings. So we've displayed art in this building for many, many years. Uh, and semi-nude female paintings on the walls. You can see one of them kind of in the back here. Um, and in the museum archives, we have reproductions of some of these semi-nudes. So here's some of the reproductions here. Um, it is believed that the artist who painted these was A.D. Cooper. So the legend is that shortly after opening, um, the owners Hunsinker and Stockton lost the deed to the property of this building um, to two very well-known gamblers in Denver, Ed Chase and Bocso Chukovic. Um, here is the picture of Chukovic. And shortly thereafter, they changed the name from Richelieu to Navarre. And that name, Navarre, has been with the building ever since regardless of what has been in and operating in the building. Um, this name comes from the French king, Henry of Navarre or Henry IV. Um, he was ruled France in the late 1500s and he was known for his sort of indulgent and opulent lifestyle as I would say many, many aristocrats at the time certainly were. Um, this, building Navarre was one of many establishments owned by Chase and Chukovic. Both of them, in addition to being known gamblers, were also known property owners and real estate magnets of such places like the Navarre um, gambling houses, theaters, hotels, saloons. Uh, they owned properties separate and also in partnership together like the Navarre here. They operated the building as a boarding house, uh, so a place to eat and gamble, again, on the lower floors, or to rent a room on the upper floors, the third and fourth floors. It is rumored, again, that prostitution was also happening in the building at this time. Uh, and the legend, again, varies from Hunsinker and Stockton losing the deed to this building as soon as six months after they opened their own establishment, the Richelieu. Uh, however, the name Richelieu was with the building at least until 1900. And then the earliest mention I could find of the building under the name Navarre or Navarre Hotel in this specific case was 1905. And Stockton was still listed as one of the owners then. So Again, this is where things get a little murky and are hard to prove or disprove, but the legend of them losing the deed in a gambling um, loss is certainly very interesting and a great story to tell. Uh, in 1892, the Brown Palace went up next, across the street. Uh, so I believe um, based on this photo, the Navarre would be just to the right over here, um, just out of frame. The, the Navarre building, or I'm sorry, the Brown Palace um, was also designed by the same architect, Frank Edbrook, and it's named after the initial owner uh, who paid for the construction, Henry C. Brown. Uh, it's also believed around this time that a tunnel was built uh, that ran underneath Tremont Place, possibly connecting the Navarre and the Brown Palace. And this is another instance where it's hard to verify all of the details. Uh, we know on the Navarre's end, the tunnel came out into what was the um, steam room from when the building was originally built in the 1880s in the basement. Uh, and it's believed the tunnel was supposed to transport uh, coal from a delivery chute on Tremont Place um, and the more alleged um, reason for the tunnel or use is that um, men who were staying at the Brown Palace and wanted to discreetly come over to the Navarre uh, for a myriad of reasons could do so without being seen. It's not known if the tunnel actually did connect or if um, 
the tunnel only went partway onto Tremont Place. Here's a photo of what the entrance looks like now. Um, we have a what you would call Trump Loy kind of um, backing in, where the tunnel came through. Uh, it has since been sealed up and filled in with masonry uh, to support the heavier street and heavier cars and more traffic um, than what the Denver Street saw in 1892. And these tunnels that ran under streets in between buildings were fairly common in the late 1800s in Denver. Again, usually believed to be used to store and maybe transport goods um, or for people to move back and forth without having to go into the elements, um, particularly when it, in the winter when it was very cold. So in 1904, Mayor Robert Speer was elected as mayor of Denver, where the name Speer Boulevard comes from. Uh, and he was mayor until I think 1912. And then again, a little later in the 19 teens, he was reelected. Uh, and it was while he was mayor that gambling and prostitution were outlawed in Denver. Uh, again, going off of hearsay, um, Mayor Robert Speer was a friend of the owners of the Navarre at the time, um, Ed Chase and Vaso Chukovic. So it's said that he uh, gave them a little bit of a heads up on these new laws that were being implemented. And so almost overnight, the Navarre transitioned from a sporting house uh, to a high-end dining club that operated into the 1930s. And they didn't have to risk you know, any sort of um, fines from disobeying these new laws. Although rumor has it that prostitution did continue in the building on the upper floors into the 1920s. Uh, there were also a few years after 1904 when the Colorado Republican Club rented some of the space as a meeting house, as um, their meeting headquarters, which is a bit odd seeing as Speer was a Democrat. I think uh, the owners Vaso, uh, Chukovic and Ed Chase were sort of courting both parties so that they could find favor with um, whomever had power over the local government. That was something that a lot of saloon owners were, were known to do, again, late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, in 1932, it became another restaurant, um, still with the name of our cafe, but this was run by Jimmy Polos. Uh, and just another image of the Navarre here, the Brown Palace across the street, um, Trinity Methodist Church on the left, and that was built in 1890, so a little in between the Navarre and the Brown Palace. And the Cosmopolitan Hotel is this large hotel in the corner, which sadly is no longer in existence. Uh, after the um, Pulos's Navarre Cafe, it, the building was another restaurant, again, keeping with the name, the Navarre. Um, this one was run by Johnny Ott, and he also hosted a nightclub in this space. Uh, Johnny Ott restored the building's old high booze and bar, like what it had when it was the Richelieu and the original Navarre Cafe. Um, and this building, or I'm sorry, this restaurant was known for its lobster, its Colorado sourced steaks, and its birdbath sized martinis, um, which sounds like quite a fun time. In the 1960s, uh, it was a private gentleman's club, which was owned and run by uh, James DeCue. And James DeCue was found dead in a bachelor's apartment that he had in the building. Um, and again, there's mystery around to how exactly he passed away. So adding again to that sort of mystery, legend, and lore of the building. Uh, after it was the gentleman's club, uh, the jazz clarinetist Peanuts Hucko uh, purchased the building and ran a jazz club out of it, uh, which he named Peanuts Hucko's Navarre, again, keeping that name with the building. Uh, he ran this club from 1967 to 1969. Uh, Hucko was 
a clarinetist who played in the bands of Glenn Miller, Louis Armstrong, and Benny Goodman. He also was in studio bands for the Lawrence Welk Show, as well as the TV studios, CBS and ABC. So he had quite, um, quite a good career before coming and opening his club in Denver. The woman in the photo next to him uh, is his wife, Louise Tobin Hucko. She was a singer who performed at the Navarre and that's how they met and eventually got married. In the 1970s, another restaurant was in this space. This one was run by William Winter. Um, the restaurant closed in the mid 70s and then the building sat vacant for a few years. However, in the 1970s um, is when the larger population started to recognize the historic significance of this building. So even though it looked like this, it was not in the best shape. Um, it was a very uh, non-accurate blue color. Uh, people took notice and in 1971 the building was designated as a Denver historic landmark and then in 1977 it was put on the National Register of Historic Places. So again these um, are designations that come to buildings of historic significance both for architecture and design uh, as well as for events and people they're associated with. And I think this building has a bit of both in that um, significance. In late 1870s, early, I'm sorry, in late 1970s and early 1980s, the building again underwent extensive renovation and restoration work. Um, and this was, most of the work was done by the architects John Prosser and C.W. Fentress. And they won an American Society of Interior Designers Award uh, for the work they did. So some of this work included restoring the cupola, which was done in 1892 um, by the Gold Evans and Goodman Associates. Uh, so we can see in this photo, you can kind of see the cupola here, and it's not present in these 1970s photos. So in 1983, um, the Museum of Western Art opened in the Navarre building, and this held the private art um, of the collection of William Foxley. So this is a collection of similar subject matter to what is currently in the building, but a completely different collection, completely different collector, but a very similar name as well, which can be a bit confusing. Um, this museum closed in the 1970s uh, and the building once again went under um, some restoration and renovation work. In 1999, the Anschutz collection moved into the building. Um, and at this time it was still private. And one of, some of the renovation work that they did on the building was to create this gallery space that is my background that you can see on the screen and that you can physically see if you come visit us. Um, but because of all these renovations, it is easy to say that very little of the building interior is original. Uh, in 2010, the collector, um, Mr. Anschutz, founded the nonprofit American Museum of Western Art, the Anschutz Collection, um, and donated the art collection and uh, the building itself to this nonprofit to create this public museum. Um, and I ran through my talk a little early, but if you want to come visit us now, um, we have over 300 pieces on view, or if you have already visited us, thank you. Uh, we have over 300 paintings on view, as well as a few um, bronzes. And they're hung salon style, which harkens back to both the building and a lot of the artworks, 19th century roots. That was um, how art that was created oftentimes in the late 1800s in Europe and the United States would have been displayed. The art that we have goes from as early as the 1820s all the way up to 2009. So we got a mix of everything, um, perceiving the history of the Western United States as viewed through the eyes of artists as evidenced in their artwork. Um, so thank you all for listening to my talk. And now uh, if anyone has questions, 
I can answer them. We don't have any questions yet, Claire, but if anybody does have any questions on the history of the building, please type them into the chat. Uh, first question is, are there any plans or blueprints from any eras of the building? Ooh, um, I know we have some from the 1990s, and I believe we have some from earlier, but I'm not 100% sure. And I know, I uh, think, sadly, I have not gone over to look myself, but the um, Denver Public Library Western History Collection has uh, papers from the Frank, Frank Ed Brooks design firm. So there could also be blueprints in that collection as well. The next question is, oh, scrolling up there, sorry. Um, is the front of the building that appears to be original when visiting inside a valid representation? Um, so, not necessarily to how the Navarre specifically looked in the 1880s, um, but our sort of front rooms uh, that we refer to as our parlors um, are meant to look like a 1880s era Victorian parlor. However, a lot of the furniture was purchased elsewhere and then brought into the building. I don't think any of the furniture that we have in those rooms is original to the Navarre building. And next question is, uh, was it, it Anschutz that created the current space with openings between floors in the gallery areas? Yes, uh, so when it was the um, Foxley Collection, the Museum of Western Art, uh, there was an opening between the fourth floor and the third floor, uh, but the third floor was full, the full length of the floor. Um, and then uh, the Anschutz collection did remove and create that opening all the way from the fourth floor to the second floor. Um, next question is, what was the style you mentioned about how the artworks are displayed? Uh, that is called salon style. Um, and it comes from the French cultural salons that were both used for art as well as discussion of philosophy, science, um, art, theology. Um, <clears throat> we have, I think, a couple questions about the porch glass. One is, when was the glass addition added? And let's see, there are glass enclosed porches on the mm -hmm. side of the building now. Were they part of the original design from your photos? It seems they were added later during the 1970s or 80s. Yeah, so, um, I know that the, the top one was added in the 1990s. Well, let me see if I can scroll back through um, some of our images. The uh, 1980 uh, um, renovation added the first two. Um, and I believe if we go all the way to the very first image, um, it, of the Brinker Collegiate Institute. Uh, it does not have those side porches, but you can see that the building itself does um, sort of extend a little wider once it's past that front room. So the, the glass parts, the, what we call our sun porches, do um, go the full width of the building. Um, next question, is the museum still collecting artwork? Uh, we occasionally acquire, but not very much. So yes. And where is the Oxley, or sorry, the, it would be William Foxley collection now? Uh, sadly, the collection was split up and sold at auction uh, in the 1990s. So it's not together in one place anymore. And it looks like the final question right now is the entire Anschutz collection currently on view or are there other items within this Western art collection that are in storage that are periodically shown? Uh, so we do have a few pieces in storage, but the majority of the collection is on view. 
a lot of what's in storage are uh, works on paper by a single artist, um, Emil Bistrom, who we do have some of his pieces on view. Another question is, could you please explain the chair and rails in the tunnel? Uh, so that would be um, the old, the rails were to an old coal cart. Uh, so the um, the coal chute was believed to be in the street itself so that coal delivery people could just shovel it into a, a chute in the street or on the side of the street instead of having to haul it into the building and down the stairs. Uh, and then that cart was put in to then move the coal um, from the chute into the furnace. Uh, why there's like a chair on the rails now, I can't really say. Uh, again, hearsay is that gentlemen could ride the rails from the Brown Palace to the Navarre and back. Do we have any other questions about the history of the building? Um, one more here. Do you exhibit pieces from private collections? We do not. So everything on display at AMWA is from the Anschutz collection. We don't um, borrow pieces or have temporary exhibitions in the, the museum.